Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so I, I would introduce Jeremy, um, but apparently <laughs> this is already a sort of reunion. Here. Uh, but for those of you who don't know Jeremy Condit, um, he's graduating from UC Berkeley soon. Um, he'll be telling us about uh, the language that he's written called Deputy and the systems that uh, benefit from this. All right, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be back here, I guess. I'm sort of a, I was sort of a serial Microsoft intern. I was here twice as an undergrad and twice more as a graduate student. Um, and so uh, coming back to Seattle, it feels like coming home. <coughs> so <coughs> I, I shall, I shall. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about Deputy, which is a, a system that I built that uses dependent types to enforce safety in system software. And maybe my clicker will work. There we go. Okay. So, first of all, a quote from Dijkstra, programming has become one of our most demanding intellectual activities requiring great clarity of expression and the utmost economy of reasoning. Presumably, if you're building a big system, you take this philosophy to heart, uh, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't quite work out this way. Uh, systems are built in a very ad hoc manner, and they're very difficult to reason about. <laughs> so, how do we build systems that actually work? Uh, the problem is systems have uh, become so huge that a single person can't understand even a small portion of it, much less how the whole thing fits together and how the whole thing works. Uh, my approach is to use programming language techniques uh, to help us solve these, the problems of big systems. Uh, using programming language techniques, we can actually uh, reason formally and mechanically about uh, lower level uh, portions of code, allowing the programmer uh, to think more at, a more, at a higher level about uh, how their code works. So in general, if you look at these two research areas, uh, software systems tends to, tends to reason about uh, how you build larger and larger systems uh, and, how you, and, and how you understand the interactions among them. And languages allows, allows you to have this sort of formal and mechanical reasoning about code. So at the risk of being perhaps a little too general, you could say that software systems rely on abstractions in order to build bigger and better systems, and languages help us enforce those abstractions. Uh, so in, in my research so far, uh, there have been two main projects that, that use this approach. One is a project called Capriccio, which uh, talked about uh, how you use, uh, whether you use, use, use threads or events to build uh, big servers like, uh, like a web server. And Capriccio showed that there was this duality between threads and events, where uh, threads and events are actually, uh, these, uh, these two approaches to programming actually produce very similar code. Um, and so really it just comes down to which, the, which model the programmer prefers. And in many cases, the thread model tends to, be, uh, tends to work well. So Capriccio used this uh, language tools and techniques in order to get the same scalability and performance out of a threads package that we'd previously seen from event systems. Today I'm going to focus on, uh, a, on a newer project, which is Deputy. And uh, this allows us to enforce type safety and memory safety in existing C programs. So uh, Deputy is sort of the language side of this, and then we've used it to build a, a tool called SafeDrive, uh, which helps enforce safety within a, uh, uh, between the, a Linux driver and the Linux kernel. So in this talk, I'm going to first give you an overview of Deputy and SafeDrive themselves. We'll talk about the motivation for the work. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about how Deputy works and then how that's been used within SafeDrive itself. Then I'll talk about in detail about how Deputy works and then, uh, and then SafeDrive itself. Finally, some related and future work. So how do we motivate this, this work? So first of all, there's millions of lines of C code out there. Uh, in fact, probably, probably in the billions of lines of code out there. Um, certainly millions that are safety critical, and there's a huge investment in, in building up this code from, uh, from nothing. You know, over the, over the past few decades, there's been a lot of programmer effort that goes into uh, making code that, uh, uh, that, is, that performs well, that is, that is well tested, that works as the, user, as the users want, and uh, it's hard to under, underestimate the value of this existing code. Uh, the problem is that this, most of these systems are written in C. And this is sort of inherently unsafe and unreliable. It doesn't give us, and it doesn't give us this, this sort of uh, higher level safety properties that we'd like to get out of, a, out of a more modern programming language. So what we'd like to do is have some sort of incremental transition. We'd like to take all of this existing code that we have in C and incrementally move it onto a, onto a more solid foundation. Uh, so this is, sort of, this is sort of the high level motivation for the work we're doing. In particular, we're going to look at type and memory safety. And, that's, and those are the things that uh, the deputy itself enforces. 
So type safety says uh, the runtime values for, for a variable or a location in memory correspond to their compile time type. So an example error here, maybe we have a, a, a variable with type manager and a variable with type intern. Now in C, you're allowed to uh, cast the manager to an intern, and it just believes you. It says, OK, this manager is now an intern. And then you can, uh, you can ask the intern to fetch coffee, except you're actually asking your manager to fetch coffee. So this, uh, this is a case where So this is a case where if you look at the third line alone, you'd like to be able to believe those types. Uh, but in C, because C allows you to do these arbitrary typecasts, you, uh, you can't actually take the compiler's word for it. This type actually has the, an appropriate value at runtime. We're also interested in memory safety, which says that, uh, which says that all accesses are, are within bounds. So if you have an array of length 42, you want to be able to, uh, to know that if you try to access the 100th element of that array, that you'll get some sort of, you'll get some sort of error. C doesn't enforce these properties. But in fact, most programmers do enforce these properties when they actually write code. So we can do a little better. We can actually take C programs and try to enforce these properties in, in these existing C programs. Why is this so important? Uh, so first of all, it's security critical. Uh, back in 19, 1988, Robert Morris's Internet Worm took down a huge swath of the Internet due to a, a buffer overflow bug in the FingerD program. Uh, and more recently, even in the early 2000s, we've had programs uh, or viruses like Code Red and SQL Slammer that uh, have used buffer overflows in, uh, in some important products that many of us use uh, in, order to, in order to, once again, take down you know, a large number of computers, cost billions of dollars of damage. Uh, so this is, a, this is a pretty important problem. And lest you believe that this has already been fixed, there have actually been a number of uh, recently exploitable bugs. So I, I got this just with a five minute search for buffer overflows on the CERT website. Uh, Internet Explorer, there was a, a buffer overflow in the handling for VML in, in September. QuickTime and Java Runtime both had buffer overflow bugs that were rem remotely exploitable in January. And all of these, you just had to direct your web browser at some page that served malicious content. And, uh, and your machine is under somebody else's control. Uh, it's particularly noteworthy that, uh, that this third case, the Java Runtime, uh, Java is supposed to be a, a, a safe language. It's supposed to have all these security properties that we'd like to enforce. But it's built upon C. It's implemented in C. And so all of the, all of the uh, dangerous parts of C that, uh, that plague us uh, sort of propagate up to languages that are built on top of it. Uh, second of all, uh, this uh, type of memory safety helps us isolate uh, parts of a system. So, and we'll see this a little bit later, uh, we, can, we can isolate, say, an operating system kernel from defects in the drivers themselves. And there's this uh, widely quoted number that, uh, where something like 85% of Windows uh, of Windows crashes are caused by bugs in the drivers themselves because the drivers are uh, less tested and written by non-experts. So if we can isolate errors, uh, if we can isolate the kernel itself from errors in the drivers, uh, that's a pretty big win. But finally, type and memory safety are a foundation for, for many other analyses we'd like to do. So pretty much any other analysis you, you perform on, on C code starts out by saying, let's assume type and memory safety and work from there. Uh, so, this, so this work uh, sort of lays the foundation for, for many future analyses. So what does deputy do? Deputy, uh, and this is, this is sort of the slide to pay attention to. So if you fall asleep for the rest of the talk, you know, here's, this is where the important stuff is. Uh, deputy enforces type and memory safety in C code. Uh, it's designed to work on existing programs and to, to scale up to, to actual real programs like the Linux kernel. Um, and you know, hopefully you can use it on, say, Windows itself. Uh, it uses dependent types to enable a modular approach. So the idea is we're going to use, we're going to talk about, uh, we're, we're going to allow the program to talk about dependencies uh, in the interfaces between, the, between different portions of the program, which allow you to use deputy just on a single portion of the program and then gradually uh, expand it to the rest of the program as, as you have time. And we'll take a case study, which is SafeDrive, where we've used this for Linux drivers that are uh, talking to the, the, the unmodified Linux kernel. So from the PL view, uh, the, interesting, the interesting part of this work is that we have dependent types for real-world programs. Uh, so dependent types have been studied pretty widely over, for a couple of decades, um, but here's an example of actually taking them and using them in real code. From the, system point, from the system's point of view, uh, we have this modular fine-grained type safety that's enforced uh, because, of, because we use a language tool. And we'll, and we'll show how this is, uh, this is actually used in SafeDrive in, in order to get modular safety. All right, so here's a, uh, here's a quick overview of what, of what Deputy uh, does and how it works. So imagine we have a, a structure called buffer that has two fields in it called data and len. Uh, 
so looking at this as the programmer, you'd probably say, okay, well, data points to a, an array of length, of, of length len. And the programmer has you know, put these two fields here for a reason. But if you're the compiler, all you see is a pointer and an integer. And you don't really know that there's any association here. So say we'd like to check that, that this access to b.data_i at the bottom of the screen is correct. Now, if you're, uh, as the programmer, you probably look through, through here and say, oh, well, we're looping from 0 to b.len, and we're accessing that element i, so it's probably safe. What previous approaches did was because they didn't, they didn't understand the, the, the correlation between these two fields was they inserted extra data. So this is uh, Secured, which I worked on at Berkeley, and Cyclone, which came out of uh, Cornell and AT&T, both took this approach. Uh, basically, instead of just having this data field, they would add two extra fields, base and end, in order to hold the base and end of the region into which this, into which this pointer pointed. And based on that, you could insert a check. You could make sure that, that the, the address that we're accessing, b.data plus i, is between the base and the end. The problem here is that we've now changed the, the layout of data structures. So uh, this data structure used to have just two fields, and now it has four, which makes it incompatible with other code that's re that relies on this, on this layout. So the problem here is that you had to essentially apply these tools to the entire program or to non nothing at, at all. And inevitably, even if you run it on, it on the whole program at once, it still wants to talk some, to some library that you don't have the, uh, access to, that you can't recompile, and it basically ends up being a big nightmare. Deputy's approach is to use a dependent type. So this is a type annotation that says that the pointer, uh, this pointer called data, is actually a pointer to a buffer of length len, where len is the other, is the other field in the structure. So now we can insert an, an assertion that just says that i is between 0 and b.len. So there are a number of advantages here. Uh, first of all, there's been no change in the data structure. Uh, because we've just inserted a type annotation as opposed to changing the layout of the data structure, this, this code can still be linked with code that's not compiled by deputy. Second, this code is easier to optimize. So you'll see that the check we've inserted checks that i is between 0 and b.len, but the programmer has actually already checked this. They've checked that i is, that I is less than b.len because we're, uh, in this case, we're actually using their metadata. So here, uh, a good optimizer could come along and determine that, I, that you no longer need to check that i is less than b.len, and uh, in fact, you could eliminate this entire assertion. Finally, there's, it's beneficial just from a, a program maintenance point of view, because the contract is in the code. The programmer has written in this code that, uh, that, this, that this pointer depends on the value of this length, um, which is a nice thing to, ha to have around for future maintainers of the code. So the key insight here is that most of the information we need in order to do uh, bounds checking and in order to do even more general type checking is already in the program in some form, but just not in a form the compiler understands. And so uh, deputies dependent types will allow you to label this information uh, and will allow the compiler to perform checks based on it. It's also important to note that, that these annotations will not be trusted in any way. Uh, they'll be used on one side of the interface to perform checking and they'll be checked on another side of the interface to make sure that they're obeyed by the rest of the code. So what we've got here is a dependent type. Just, yep. Uh, so then, before you said one of the, of the advantages that you can call code that was not compiled with deputy, right? Yeah. But then, of course, you're not going to get these guarantees, right? Sure. Yeah. You Whereas only get secured. I guess if you if you were able to, to to run it on everything, you will get the runtime checking. Right. It's sort of what we found is that is that you know there's sort of there's n units of programmer work in order to apply secured to a big program. And you know, there's about n units of work to uh, apply deputy to a similar size program. Uh, the, the advantage is that you get to you get to uh, you get to apply that, those units of work and test them bit by bit as you as you progress through the program. So you can apply deputy to a single uh, a single source file, link it against the rest of the program, run it, see what you what you broke, fix it. With C cured, you have to make all of these modifications. Then you run the program, something breaks, and you have no idea. Uh, so, there's, so the major benefit is this incremental approach. Um, because, we're, because we're just using the programmer's data, uh, uh, we can make this transition bit by bit. But isn't it true that with secure, you can also, um, I guess the versions where the metadata was out of line, you were actually able to link it with stuff that was not compiled with secure? Right. Um, so the question, I'm not sure if I should be uh, repeating questions here for the, yeah. So the question was uh, whether you could, uh, with secure, store the metadata elsewhere. Um, which is actually a project that I worked on as, as my master's thesis. Um, you could separate out, uh, you know, if you had a list of a uh, list of objects that had that had secured metadata, you could separate that into a list of objects of the original format and a list of metadata objects. Um, the big disadvantage there 
was that even though you could separate out the data structures and pass the, only the data portion to an external code, uh, the external code was not aware that there was this extra metadata that needed to be maintained. Yeah, so they're out of sync. If the other guy makes changes to it, you have to sync them up somehow. Uh, so really, it's better just to be able to say, here's the data. It's already in the code. And that, even, that other code that you're passing this to, even though it won't uh, be checked by deputy, will hopefully uh, be designed so that it maintains these invariants. OK. So this is so the, right, so the key insight here is that the bounds information is already here, and we can use this to do checks. Uh, so, uh, so what we've got here is a dependent type. We've, got, we've declared a dependency between these two fields. And the, uh, the, big, the big problem with dependent types is that now the meaning of a type depends on the runtime value of some other uh, part of the program. So in order to reason about whether it's safe to have something in data, we have to, we have to think about what runtime values Len might take on. And I'm getting a call from somebody who apparently objects to this talk. I just want to know how it's going. Yeah. All right. This is what you never want to have happen, huh? Uh, anyway, so uh, dependent types are uh, types whose meaning depends on the, uh, the value of some other, run to, uh, of some other portion of the program. Uh, so the big, the big challenge here is that in order to check these types, we need to know what values other parts of the program might take on. So in order to check whether, uh, whether data has this type, we need to know what values len might take. On the other hand, dependent types enable these modular, this modular checking because we can declare the, the dependencies between these fields and, and we don't have to add any new metadata. Uh, okay, so we get this, modul we get this modular checking. Uh, why is this important? We've already gone over this a little bit um, in the process of these questions, but basically it's, a, it's an alternative to whole program analysis. If a source code's unavailable or we can't recompile it, then we can, then we can uh, apply this tool to just one portion of the program. And we also, it al also allows this incremental approach. So we can, we can improve the program module by module. Uh, and we can also improve the code quality bit by bit, because we can, just, we can even mark trusted portions of the code that we'll come back to later once, we, once the tool improves or once we, have, uh, once we have time to redesign the code. So how does this work in, in an actual system? Uh, imagine we have a kernel with a few drivers that plug into it. Uh, the problem here is that, is that a bug in the driver uh, can bring down the entire system. It can uh, essentially uh, cause corruption within the kernel itself. Uh, this is a pattern that shows up a lot. So this is uh, the kernel driver is, a, is an obvious example, but there's also you know, web servers with modules. There's web browsers with plugins. Um, this, uh, this pattern shows up all over the place where you have sort of untrusted and untested code plugging into a much more trusted and tested code base. Uh, <clears throat> A previous system solution is uh, the, the Nooks project from the University of Washington, which had an isolation layer that surrounded uh, a Linux driver and protected it from, uh, uh, protected the, the, the Linux kernel from errors in the driver. The problem here was the driver can still corrupt itself. So if you have a file system driver, for example, it could corrupt data in your file system even though it wasn't bringing down the entire kernel. And second, this isolation layer is pretty complicated. It's about 22,000 lines of code that has to do with uh, marshalling data through uh, marshalling kernel objects that were previously just passed directly between the kernel and, and the driver. Now, an alternative approach is to use this language approach that we talked about earlier uh, with something like Secure to Cyclone. Uh, now, here we enforce safety within the, within the driver itself. So we rule out these type and memory safety errors uh, within the driver and prevent them from corrupting the kernel. Uh, but we still have to change the interface in order to do this. And that means that we need this adapter layer, which is just as complicated as the isolation layer we just got rid of. With Deputy, we'll be, able to, uh, we'll be able to enforce safety without changing the interface and therefore have the, the driver plug directly into the kernel without this, without this fancy adapter or fancy isolation layer. All right. Uh, oh, so the, the cost here is that we had to annotate this interface. So we need programmer effort to go through and, and indicate uh, what the relationships are between these variables. Um, but as it turns out, all of these, all of these solutions involve some form of programmer effort. And we'd like to have the programmers expending this effort in a, at a task that they understand and sort of at their level of reasoning, as opposed to writing this sort of one-off adapter or isolation layer. And of course, we need the driver source as well. Um, though this is something that we could, we could address with future work if we could have a verifier that verifies that a, that code has been properly processed by, by deputy or a similar tool. Okay, so that's the high-level view of this work. Uh, let's take a look at how deputy itself works. 
As I've said before, uh, Deputy relies on dependent types to talk about relationships between variables in the programs. And we can use, and we can use this to annotate common C idioms. So you, know, you, you have a buffer here and it's length over here. Previous dependent type systems are sort of inappropriate for this, for this work because uh, they expect to do most of their checking statically. And these programs that we're, that we're, that we're running this on are, don't really expect, uh, weren't, weren't, written, weren't written with the expectation that they would, uh, that they would be checked by a, a st one of these static checkers. So the big challenges here are that we'd like to uh, reason about runtime values at compile time in order to check these dependent types. Um, we ha want to handle mutation because uh, it's possible that C code will change a value that somebody else depends upon. And finally, we just want to make this usable for, for real programmers. So to see the, the high level view of, of how deputy differs from previous dependent type systems, um, we'll look at static versus hybrid checking. So previous, previous dependent type systems took a static approach, deputy takes a hybrid approach. Imagine that uh, all programs could be put somewhere on this spectrum between correct programs and incorrect programs. On the far left, we have the trivially correct programs, like Hello World. And on the far right, we have trivially incorrect programs, uh, like something that just crashes immediately and obviously. Uh, an operating system is probably somewhere in the middle, bit, in the middle of this and maybe on the other side of this, of this line. So if you had an ideal type checker, <laughs> maybe. If you had an ideal type checker, yeah, yeah, singularity is oh, way over there. there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey, uh, hey, on my screen, it's to the left, you know? <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so, if we had an ideal type checker, we'd be able to split these into, at compile time, into two categories. We could eject, uh, accept all correct programs and reject all incorrect programs. Um, but thanks to the halting problem, this is impossible for any, for any non-trivial definition of correctness. So, if you have a previous dependent ty type system, what they did was they accepted a very small fraction of the correct programs and rejected a lot of the correct programs in addition to the incorrect ones. What Deputy's gonna do, uh, so, you know, uh, the operating system uh, that we're hoping to make correct in some point in the future uh, sits somewhere in this, in this region of programs that we've rejected, even though they're hopefully correct. Uh, so we have no runtime checks, but this is unsuitable for existing code. Uh, for Deputy, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to accept this same small fraction of, of programs, reject the number of incorrect programs, and then in the middle, we'll accept a bunch of them with runtime checks. And then at runtime, we'll distinguish between the ones that are uh, where the checks succeed and where the checks fail. And in this case, uh, the ones that we, ac we can actually accept at, ru at runtime are uh, a much greater fraction of the correct programs. And so hopefully our operating system will eventually fall uh, in this area. Yes? So is the line that says checks may fail suddenly, so it actually goes into the correct programs. So I guess that's... Still right. There are some cases that we still might not be able to, that we still might not be able to catch with a, even with a runtime check. Yeah, yeah, the checks themselves might be too conservative. Point, I think the, the picture, I, I know it's not going to be possible in 2D, but you should probably also have some correct programs that you're going to reject, right? You still might some, have some, right? Is some correct programs that, that we would re reject at compile time, yes. Right. Yes. Uh, so, right, so the advantage here is that this is more suitable for existing code because it's conceivable that we could have an operating system that could be accepted using this technique, uh, but some errors will get delayed. And in fact, some errors might never get caught because if, if we're relying on runtime checks, we have to actually execute that code path in order to find the error. So to see why this is useful, consider this previous, previous example that we saw uh, where we looped from, from zero to b.lin, except now we're looping from zero to limit. Uh, and this, this variable limit is, is derived by calling some other function called get limit. And now in order to eliminate this check statically, we'd have to reason about the relationship between b.lin, which involves knowing something about how get limit works, and so on. So there could be some higher level programmer invariant that, uh, that the programmer knows about and the programmer is reasoning about here, uh, but we just can't take care of it at compile time. So this is hard to prove statically. Um, in deputy, we can just leave this check in at runtime and take care of it then. So uh, a quick overview of how the compiler works. We're, we're going to take a code with some programmer annotations that are once again untrusted. We're going to infer some additional annotations uh, so that the programmer doesn't have to do all the work. We'll go through and add runtime checks and then optimize those checks. And we'll produce a safe executable at the other side. So I'll show you a little bit about how we insert those checks and uh, why the optimization is important. <laughs> 
So imagine that we uh, have a pointer that's labeled as count n. So this pointer has, has, n has a pointer to a buffer of n elements, and we want to dereference it. In this case, the only check we need to perform is to make sure that n is greater than 0. Uh, because if n is greater than 0, there's at least one element there to dereference. Now, if you're a, a PL researcher, you're used to writing down rules like this. Um, so this is sort of the standard rule for a C type system, which says, in this case, that uh, a variable p has type tau star for some type tau. And, if you, and so if this holds, then this guy must hold, which says if you dereference p, it has type tau. But of course, we've said nothing about whether it's actually valid to dereference it at this point in the program. Um, so what we'd like to do with deputy is add a little bit of extra information to this check. Here we say, uh, here we, we say that we now have this count n annotation. And we want to check to make sure n is greater than 0. I've put this second premise in a box to indicate that it might be checked at runtime instead of at compile time. So pretty much any time you have one of these rules that needs to say something about a runtime value, um, it'll be boxed uh, in the type checking rule. Uh, it's n worth noting that in the actual system, we, we reason about null pointers, but I've omitted it in this slide just for, uh, just for clarity. So for another example, uh, let's take arithmetic. We have a pointer p with the same annotation, and we want to add some integer e. Now here, we want to check that the new pointer is still within the bounds of this, of this array, and the, uh, and the new type of this pointer will be, sort of, will be correspondingly smaller because it's, because it's further along in the array. The check we want, of course, is that e is between 0 and n. Uh, so this is the old rule. We'd say that uh, if we have a pointer p with type tau star and some integer, then we can add the two and get a new pointer of the same type. But again, it doesn't say anything about whether, this is, whether the bounds uh, are obeyed. So here we're going to say, uh, if this original pointer has count n, and this integer is between 0 and n, then we produce a new pointer uh, whose count is n minus e. Uh, so when, once you've run all these rules, we'll, uh, we can sort of accumulate all the runtime checks that are associated with these boxed premises. Uh, the idea here is that because we've deferred some of these checks to runtime, we have a hybrid type checker. So now let's take a, a combined example. Here, we've, here we have the this, this same pointer p, and we're accessing element 5, which is an arithmetic plus a dereference. Uh, so if you, if you uh, smash these rules together, uh, what comes out is this. Uh, the details are not too important, but what is important is that you have, uh, we have a bunch of runtime checks that are all somewhat redundant. Uh, here we've, we've checked that 0 is less than or equal to 5, which is trivial and we don't need to worry about. Uh, we've also checked that n is greater than or equal to 5 and that n is greater than 5, uh, which is also redundant. So the optimizer has to come through and take care of these checks. It'll figure out which of these checks are, are uh, actually relevant and get rid of the ones that aren't. So the final check the deputy will insert will just check that n is greater than 5, which is the one you'd expect. So the overall strategy here is that we have a simple pass of the code to generate these checks, and then a second pass with a, with a flow-sensitive and much smarter optimizer that can eliminate these checks where, where it's statically possible. So how do we deal with mutation? Let's imagine that we have a dependency on a variable uh, that might itself get changed. So here I've introduced two new annotations. One is this sentinel annotation, which just says, yeah. Can you come back a yeah. Here I put in a value for n, which was just um, short of the wraparound for the 32 for have a figure enters. Mm -hmm. and you can eliminate the check for less than zero, so, it's, so I potentially there's a dereference outside of the array bounds. So the, the way the checks are designed, um, the, if a pointer has a, has a non-null value, then its, then its bounds have already been checked. They've been derived from some allocation. So we already know that those bounds represent. So in fact, the bounds are stored not in terms of the length, but in terms of pointers delimiting the, the upper and lower uh, bound of the, of the pointer. And those have already been, those have been sort of derived and checked from some allocation point. Um, so we know that, those, that the lower bound is less than or equal to the upper bound. And the checks for arithmetic make sure the pointer never strays out of that, and checks to make sure there's no overflow that could, that could uh, uh, give us the false impression that this is still within bounds. Um, which is a short way of saying that we check for overflow and make sure that we won't get those sort of errors. Yeah, this, these checks are a little bit simplified. Um, so for example, in the real system, we'd also check to make sure p is not null. Uh, OK. <coughs> So here's, uh, here's the, our mutation example. We, and we've got two new annotations. One is the sentinel annotation, which just says this pointer is for, is, is for bounds purposes only and is not to be dereferenced or moved itself. Uh, we also have a, a much more explicit bounds annotation, which is actually, which is actually what, uh, a more general case of count, 
which specifies explicitly the base and end of the pointer uh, of, of the relevant pointer. So here we said that, say that data is bounded below by itself and above by end. Now in a previous dependent type system, um, most, <clears throat> most of those previous systems said that you couldn't depend on mutable data. Uh, so it would simply be, be, be illegal to, uh, to modify the value of something that somebody else depended upon. Here we have data, which, is, which appears in one of these dependencies. But it's actually legal to increment it. Because if we increment data, uh, we still, we still uh, we've preserved the type invariant. So data is still bounded below by, by data and above by end. We've just essentially forgotten about this first element of the array. So we'd like to be able to, to accept these sorts, of, these sorts of modifications where possible. All right, so previous dependent type systems uh, disallow this assignment, but Deputy will use some, some reasoning from axiomatic semantics in order to make this uh, a little bit more possible. <clears throat> So what we're going to do is we're going to view the, uh, our type invariant as a, as a predicate on the state of the program. We're going to say we want to preserve this, uh, uh, the invariant that these types hold at every point in the program. Uh, so here we have, we have the types of data and end. We want to preserve it across uh, this assignment of data plus one to data. Now if we look at this in a little bit, of, in a little bit more generality, we could say we have some invariant gamma at the, at the beginning, and we want to show that gamma holds after, after uh, this assignment of some expression e to some variable x. Uh, using axiomatic semantics, we can compute the weakest precondition of gamma across x gets e, which is gamma with e substituted for x uh, throughout that predicate. Um, <clears throat> so what we, really, what, we, what we really need to show now is that the original gamma implies gamma with, with e substituted for x. So this is, uh, so this is sort of, this is the main reasoning that we need, that we need to worry about in order to, uh, in order to reason about mutation in these programs. To see how this works out in our example, uh, let's, let's apply this weak, weakest precondition rule. And so here we substituted data plus one for data throughout this invariant. Uh, and what we need to show is that our invariant implies this weakest precondition. Of course, it's easy to see that because end has this type in star sentinel, it has this type at the end as well. Uh, the interesting part is this case here. Uh, but you, can, you should be able to see that uh, starting with, starting with uh, a pointer data that's bounded by data and end, uh, we should be able to show that data plus one is bounded by data plus one and end. And in fact, type rules like the ones that I've showed you earlier allow us to derive this. Uh, what they end up with is a runtime check that makes sure that data plus one is less than or equal to end, because we don't want data plus one to go past the upper bound of the array. So this, is the, uh, this shows how we can use this weakest precondition logic in order to, in order to uh, handle mutation in some of these cases. What really matters here is, is this reasoning on the left, which says that gamma implies gamma with E substituted for X. Uh, it's important to note here that we haven't talked about any specific dependent types. We haven't talked about bound or count or any of the other types that we're, that we're going to use in deputy. Uh, so really, this, this reasoning is very general. We can have a single rule that talks about how to, how to deal with mutation and, and assignment uh, independent of any of these other types we want to add. Uh, and this is nice because we'd like, to be able to, we'd like to be able to build a system where we can add new dependent types to express new idioms that, the programmer, that we find the programmer using. What are the restrictions here? Uh, the main restriction is that, uh, dependency, that variables can only depend on other variables in the immediately enclosing scope. So local variables can depend on other locals. Um, we can have structure fields depending on other structure fields, globals on other globals. Uh, but you can't, have, uh, you can't depend uh, sort of across across pointer boundaries. So for example, you can't, uh, you can't depend on the, on, uh, on, on the value you get from dereferencing a pointer. And you can't depend on the result of calling a function. Uh, because those are things that this weakest precondition logic uh, uh, wouldn't be able to reason about appropriately. All right, so we also need to uh, consider usability in addition to uh, how we add checks and how we deal with mutation. And inevitably, this, this boils down to some inference is required. Uh, we, want to, we want to have the programmer add some checks, and then fill in the rest. We have three techniques, automatic dependencies, a pointer graph, and some basic assumptions. We're just going to focus on automatic dependencies uh, for now. So the way this wor technique works is we'd like to uh, be able to come up with a, we would like to be able to infer a new annotation for some local variable. So imagine we have a case where, where uh, here we have a function foo that takes uh, two variables, p and q, both of which are annotated with their length, p len and q len. But we also have a variable x that's a local variable that hasn't been annotated. Um, and you'll see that there's a conditional. So x might take on the value of p or q, depending on which way the conditional goes. And then we want to access x. 
but we don't know what to uh, what bounds to test x against because it might have length p len or it might have length q len. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert a new variable x len and update that variable whenever we update x. So if we assign p to x, we're going to assign p len to x. If we assign q to x, we'll assign q len to x. And that way, uh, we can check down here that uh, we can check against x len. So we've, we've sort of introduced some flow sensitivity into the program uh, by, by introducing this new variable to track, uh, to track any updates uh, for its associated pointer. Uh, and once again, this is, a, this is a pretty general technique. This doesn't, this doesn't require any knowledge about a particular, a particular dependent type. As long as, you can, as long as you can basically insert new variables and copy over the data from other variables, then everything works fine. So the end result here is that uh, we can handle most locals automatically. And the, programmer, the, the programmer's only responsibility is to add these annotations on the parts of the program, on, on function parameters and return values, and on globals and on structures. Things that are things that can be visible across function across module boundaries, where they'd have to insert, insert annotations anyway. Uh, right. So the overall point here is that xlen is updated when x is updated. Overall, yeah. So how did you know that you didn't need a sentinel and bound annotation for x? Um, in fact, so in fact, the the only annotation that deputy cares about is bound, because sentinel and count are both special cases of bound. Uh, so what we really do, actually, is we just infer, uh, for, for any pointer variable where we know that we need some bounds information, we infer a, a lower bound and an upper bound that get tracked appropriately. Uh, we, have, we have some inference that, that allows you to eliminate one of these bounds in some cases. Like if you only increment the pointer forward, then we don't have to, we don't have to inf track one of these lower, lower bounds. But yeah, j basically the, bounds, the, the case of the bound annotation takes care of them all. All right. Uh, so in general, Deputy handles uh, bounded pointers. It, has, it handles null terminated bounded pointers. And that's, there's actually an in, a very interesting interaction between null termination and these bounded pointers uh, that I'm not going to talk about now, but if you're interested, ask me later. And there's tagged unions as well. All of, these, all of these first three things on the left involve some form of dependent types. Um, there are also a number of features uh, over on the right, the polymorphic functions, allocators, and memset and memcopy, uh, which don't involve dependent types, but are very useful anyway. Uh, finally, on this, uh, at the bottom, these are the things the deputy trusts. And the most important of those is deallocation, and I should, I should probably add concurrency here as well. Um, deputy assumes that the program is race-free, so you're not going to have race conditions breaking these invariants between checks and, and uh, the data that relies on them. Um, it, also <clears throat> it also depends on the correctness of deallocation. So if you, uh, if you if you deallocate a variable and create a dangling pointer, you can create all sorts of messes that way. Uh, Deputy assumes that you've handled that some other way, either by trusting the programmer or by running a garbage collector or something like that. Of course, we trust external library code. Um, this is pretty standard. You, know, you, you check locally and assume that other people uphold their, uh, the invariants that you're depending on. And finally, uh, the user can specify some trusted code. They can say, uh, I've checked this. Trust me. It's fine. Overall, uh, how does the compiler look to the programmer? So I've, I showed you this, this uh, diagram before, where we take the code with programmer annotations, we in, do some inference, add runtime checks, uh, do some optimization, and produce a safe executable. Um, when, the, when the programmer actually runs this, they can get a warning from the inference module that says that they have insufficient annotations. So uh, for example, if, you're, if, you don't, if you don't annotate a pointer that's on a function boundary, uh, deputy will just assume that it's a pointer to a single object. But if you try to increment that pointer, deputy will say, something is, going str is a little funny here. You might want to annotate that pointer with something more interesting. Uh, when, you're, when you're adding runtime checks, you might get a type mismatch. Like if you're just, com if you're just uh, uh, assigning one pointer to another pointer of a completely different type, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a type mismatch there. In the optimizer, you might get some compile time failures, where the optimizer decides that a particular check will always fail. Uh, and it'll tell you about that before the program ever runs. And these, this is sort of the, the set of things that are, that are rejected at compile time in that previous diagram. And finally, of course, when you run the program, you can get some runtime failures there as well. <clears throat> All right, so that's sort of how Deputy works. Uh, and so let's go and look at how we can use it within a systems application like SafeDrive. So in SafeDrive, uh, this is a sort of expanded version of the, of the picture you saw earlier, where we have a bunch of drivers plugging into the Linux kernel. Here we've applied Deputy to a number of drivers. 
And we've added uh, these yellow boxes are a resource tracker and a recovery subsystem that have been placed between the, deputy, the deputized drivers and the Linux kernel. Um, now we have added, I said before that there's a, there's a benefit in you know, not adding a lot of extra, extra stuff to the kernel. Um, I should point out that these are, all, these are <clears throat> still very small, like on the order of maybe a thousand lines of code, and they're very simple. It just a, keeps a list of resources that the driver is using and can restart the driver when necessary. So you still get the benefit of, of having the drivers talk directly to the kernel without having to modify kernel objects or marshal them across some interface. So the resource tracker uh, records kernel data used by the driver, like memory allocated and locks acquired. Uh, and the recovery subsystem handles a failure by uh, releasing these resources and restarting the driver. And this, uh, this tracker and recovery system was done by Feng Zhao. Uh, Deputy, of course, is used, is used to sort of de detect failures within these drivers. So we used Deputy on a bunch of Linux 2.6 drivers. We used it on six different drivers of four different categories, including network, sound, video, and USB. Each of these were 10 to 20,000 lines of code, except for one of them, I think, that was a, about 3,000 lines. Uh, we needed to modify about 1 to 4% of these lines. Um, and in general, just to give you an idea of the amount of work, for somebody who's familiar with Deputy but not with uh, Linux drivers, it's about an afternoon of work to convert a driver. Uh, so it's not a huge burden. The nice thing is that, is that, once again, this is all incremental. So you don't have to sit down and convert the entire Linux kernel. You just have to focus on a, uh, you know, 10 to 20,000 lines of code and the kernel inter and, and uh, be able to annotate the, the kernel functions it uses. Uh, so we had to modify a few thousand lines of code and inserted several hundred annotations. Uh, the far right column shows some trusted code that's, that still lies in these, uh, in these drivers, where for some reason uh, we couldn't use deputies, uh, deputies annotations to describe what the driver was doing. To test this out, uh, we injected some bugs uh, all at compile time. And there were 140 tests that looked at seven different categories of bugs. And then we ran a driver with both with and without safe drive. Uh, so the, you'll see on the top line that out of those 140 tests, we had 44 crashes where uh, the failure in the driver caused the entire Linux kernel to crash. We had 21 failures where the test failed for some reason but did not cause the entire kernel to crash. And then finally over on the right here, we have these 75 passes, uh, which are cases where there was a bug in the driver, but the bug did not manifest itself somehow, like it was on a path that was not reached or something like that. Uh, the important feature here, or the important thing to note here, is that Deputy caught all 44 of these crashes uh, either at compile time or runtime. So in 10 cases, it caught the error at compile time. In 34, it caught the error at runtime. In all these cases, uh, catching, this, catching this failure allowed SafeDrive to correctly restart the driver. In these failure cases, Deputy did not catch as many of these errors. Um, in fact, 19 of them got through. Uh, in a lot of cases, this is because the, the error that was introduced was outside Deputy's definition of correctness. So for example, if you change a flag that's being passed to a driver that doesn't have anything to do with memory or type safety, uh, you might get an error even though, even though Deputy thinks it's fine. Uh, finally, in this right-hand column, Deputy actually caught eight errors among these 75 case, cases that passed. And these are because there's actually a bug here. There's actually a bug that's been introduced that might not have been hit or might have been hit but didn't manifest itself as a failure or, or a crash. And Deputy has, has found these and uh, preemptively restarted the driver. In terms of performance, um, this is the combined performance for both Deputy's, Deputy's runtime checks and safe drive itself. Uh, for CPU overhead, we had less than 25% in all cases. And in most cases, it was more like 5 to 10%. Um, there's also some throughput overhead. And you'll notice that, in particular, on this line, uh, the CPU is maxed out for this test, so all the overhead you see is in terms of reduced throughput instead of, reduced, in, instead of increased CPU overhead. So you can kind of take these two graphs as being one number. Uh, <clears throat> the relevant comparison with Nooks, uh, so Nooks ran a similar test on the E1000 driver in Linux 2.4, uh, we're using 2.6, and they had uh, about an order, order of magnitude more overhead. So they had 46% uh, 46% on this test, on this uh, received test versus R4%, and 111 versus R12. So the take-home message here is that by using language tools, uh, we can pr uh, provide finer grain safety checks. So we check safety both within the driver as opposed to between the driver and the kernel. We provide better performance, as you saw on the, on the, last, on the last slide. And it's also a simpler imp implementation. It's uh, you know, about 1,000 lines of straightforward code, um, plus the deputy compiler, of course versus this uh, one-time uh, heavyweight adapter. Uh, so th 
you know, the overall point is that language techniques can provide a, a much better way to enforce these safety properties. Yes? So, so is this comparison entirely fair? OK. And <laughs> in, in what ways is it unfair? Well, can you think of any ways that it might not be fair? Um, well, one way is that we're comparing Linux 2.6 versus 2.4 and 2.6, but probably not a huge deal. That's not what I'm thinking. So you could say, I mean, so objections I've heard in the past are things like, you know, well, uh, you're comparing the, the, the runtime cost of Nux's isolation layer to the runtime cost of Deputy's runtime checks, which is sort of a different thing. Um, but you could argue that you could argue that you know you're getting safety either through one route or through the other, and and what matters is sort of the end to end. Uh, so let me ask more directly. So are you getting the same kind of safety guarantees from both systems? Okay, um, that's a that's a good question, and and no, not exactly. In fact, you could use the two systems together if you wanted to. The nice thing about so the nice thing about uh, uh, the nice thing about Nux's approach is that it is that it takes a very uh, it's, it's sort of a, a very blunt hammer. You know, if, if you modify anything in the kernel space, uh, <clears throat> then that's then that will be prevented. Uh, in Deputy's case, if you trust some some portion of code and that and that code happens and, and that code happens to be bad, you could still corrupt the kernel. Um, whereas Nooks uh, Nooks's approach uh, might rule that out. On the other hand, Deputy gives you these fine-grained safety checks within the driver itself, um, whereas Nooks just says any modifications within the driver are fine. Uh, so there, there are definitely there's a bit of a trade-off here um, in terms of in terms of which form of safety you'd like. So, so one particular thing I'm thinking of is is there might be invariants in the kernel driver interface that you cannot express in the sure. in, in your language. So even though you might have no trusted code in your in your driver itself, because some invariant you cannot express, you cannot prove that you're maintaining it, and in that in fact that could corrupt the kernel. Sort of, for example, later when the kernel yeah. accesses some bound or something, right? Yeah, it's definitely true that you know there are there are higher level protocols that the drivers need to obey when talking to the kernel, and neither Deputy nor Nooks tries to reason about those. Um, they're just Nooks prevents the, the corruption completely, right? Um, well, if the corruption is is through misuse of a of a of a kernel interface, then you could still get the same the same problem in Nooks, as I, as I understand it, at least. Um, I'm like, thinking, I mean, are, are you thinking? You're thinking of like, you know, the correct order of operations. No, I'm thinking on, that the, the driver writes some some location in memory that mm -hmm. the kernel is using too, mm -hmm. and from the from the deputy perspective, it's just an integer in memory somewhere. So writing it, you check the memory safety; it's fine. You can write it, but in fact, this integer has some meaning, which means it's maybe a bound of some buffer that the kernel is going to access, right? Sure. And since that's not annotated in the deputy interface. The driver can safely write that memory location, and then when it goes back into the kernel, the kernel will actually crash because it will corrupt itself. Sure. Because you put a wrong value there. Yeah. Now, if it, with Nooks, as far as I understand, when it copies this data back, it will do some 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 checking, right, on in, at runtime right. to maintain these invariants. Right? right. On the other hand, the copying isn't the copying in Nooks isn't perfect. So they you know they could they would have to have somebody specifically check for this. You could say you know you're you're it's it's equally possible to write something in Nooks that checks to maintain that checks invariants when copying back to the kernel. Uh, it's it's equally possible to write a deputy annotation that would that would express that that check as well. Well, what I'm thinking is is actually a deputy annotation that you cannot actually write. That is, it's it's beyond your your language, right? It would be easy to do at runtime right. and add it to Nooks, but it's hard. It's it's not possible to write it in your in your annotation what, what we hope is that deputies actually is flexible enough to be able to accommodate a wide range of these annotations. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I, like, it's certainly possible that there would be things that, that Nooks could check more easily that deputy could not. Um, but what we're, what we're actually hoping to have for the longer term is to allow you to extend deputy with new, uh, with new annotations that allow you to express new idioms that are you know, maybe specific to a, particular, to a particular system. So maybe you could write, uh, uh, in, in a way, these, these idioms the, the the implementation of each of these of each of these types is is itself not not checked or it, like it's it's trusted that you the, that there are these uh, particular checks that maintain the invariant of of each of these of each of these dependent type annotations. So you can you can encapsulate a lot of sort of interesting logic within those within those uh, dependent type annotations. And so perhaps you could have one that 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 basically declared this uh, this particular invariant that you're talking about. And allowed deputy to check it, or basically indicated, you know, when you write to this integer, make sure it has this appropriate invariant. Put in this check. Um, so it's 
it's entirely possible that we could extend deputy to do similar checking. Um, but I agree that there are that there are cases like that where where you know Nooks takes a different approach and might have an easier time checking these invariants. Um, it's it's also worth noting that that, that the um, the this copying back and forth is sort of a blessing and a curse um, because in some cases in some cases the when you're copying data back and forth between the driver and the kernel uh, you're you, you know now your driver and kernel behave slightly differently than they did in the original system and you might be uh, you might be causing as many problems as you solve. Okay, uh, yeah. So the resource manager in Safe Drive that was called only on an exception, on a runtime exception. Right. So there, well, there's, a, there's a resource tracker that's called uh, periodically during normal execution. So when the driver says, I want to allocate some memory, uh, it goes to the resource tracker to say, okay, remember that the driver owns this portion of memory. And then there's another subsystem that's invoked only when an error is occurred. Does the resource tracker do something with garbage collection? Or do you um, just trust the... Well, it, if, if, the, if the driver frees an object or releases an op a resource, then the, then, the, then the resource tracker will say, okay, that resource is no longer owned by the driver. Um, uh, but then, so, the, so the, the, the resource tracker should have an up-to-date list of all kernel resources the driver is using. Um, when the, when the driver goes away, we could free those for the driver if it hasn't already, but hopefully it should have done that in its normal execution. And if an error occurs, of course, we'll free all that stuff for the driver. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so uh, finally, some related and future work. First of all, for C safety, there have been a number of approaches uh, that, that try to take existing C programs and, and make them safer. There are uh, fat pointer approaches like C cured and Cyclone uh, that I've talked about earlier, and even earlier work called Safe C. There's another approach uh, that uses a global splay tree. That is, they use a, uh, a separate data structure off to the side that stores information about all allocated objects. Uh, previously, uh, so the Ruiz and Lamb work and the Jones and Kelly work <coughs> uh, uh, used this technique, but they had a single giant splay tree that stored all the information for, uh, for doing bounce checks. And this ended up be having a you know, 5x to 10x slowdown. Uh, so it made it impractical for, for normal use. More recently at Illinois, uh, there's, they've designed safe code, which, uh, which uses a, a pool allocation in order to separate out these trees. So you can put uh, only a small number of, uh, so you can have separate trees for each, for each abstract location in your program, and you can store a smaller amount of data in each tree. And this makes it much more efficient. It gives it sort of secured-like uh, 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 runtime overhead. The disadvantage is that still you need a, a whole program instrumentation and control over the allocation. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, there's, there's this work on uh, using a shadow process. You can actually have a second processor to go along and, and do the checks uh, in parallel with the first one. Though there's sort of limited parallelism you can get there because there are lots of data and control dependencies. In terms of dependent types, there's been uh, a bunch of work on having general purpose languages that use dependent types in order to uh, give the programmer a little, bit more, a little bit more expressive power in the type system. So Xanadu and dependent ML are sort of the, the imperative and functional versions uh, from Hongwei Xi and Frank Fenning. Um, the main difference here is that these are, so first of all, these are all statically checked, but also they draw their dependencies from a completely separate language. So they, they're, uh, you, when you write a dependent type, you don't talk about uh, a dependency on some other value in the program. You talk about uh, you write dependencies in some com in some separate constraint language. Um, so this is so this is it's nice if you're writing new code, um, but the but Deputy is sort of uh, designed to 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 focus on uh, existing code that has dependencies between um, where it's easier to express dependencies between data, data elements themselves instead of having a separate constraint language. Uh, Cayenne is a, another functional language that uses uh, dependent types and is undecidable. Um, they, instead of having a, a restricted constraint language, they just say you can write down anything, but uh, who knows, the compiler may take forever. Um, <clears throat> there's also been a fair amount of work on hybrid type, check, type checking from Cormac Flanagan, um, and there's also work by Ooh et al. that uh, had, a statically typed, uh, had a statically typed portion of the program and a dependently typed portion of the program and used runtime checks in the boundaries. And uh, finally, there are lots of other similar approaches that use dependencies. So there's Greg Morissette's work at, at, uh, on whore type theory, which is sort of uh, addressing the same problem in the context of Cyclone. 
And of course, at, uh, here at Microsoft, there's been the Cell annotation language, which uses very similar annotations on uh, lots of existing code like, uh, like Windows and Office, and their static checker, ESPX. Uh, in fact, uh, it's entirely possible that we could use deputy-like annotations, uh, uh, a deputy-like tool with those annotations um, in order to add some runtime checks in addition to you, uh, using their static checking. Could you drill down one level farther and okay. describe the difference between Sal and ESPX and deputy? So the, the, main, the main difference between uh, Sal and ESPX is that they're designed uh, primarily for static checking. So it means that if you have, if you, if you have sort of the, the programmer manpower to you know, change your code to conform with the static checker and or design a static checker that is, that is powerful enough to deal with real code, um, then, you can do, then you can do pretty well. Deputy allows you to occupy sort of inter intermediate ground where you, can, um, where you can check a lot, of, a lot of things statically and then insert runtime checks for the things that you couldn't otherwise check. So you can, basically it, it reduces the amount of programmer time um, to get their code working with this, with these new annotations. In terms of the annotation languages themselves, they're very similar annotations, uh, except that except that cells annotations tend to be uh, tend to be more like pre and post conditions, whereas deputies are more are more like refinements of the types. So they're flow insensitive, and they must hold on a given type at any point in the program instead of just at the beginning and end of a function. Um. <clears throat> right. So the main difference is the static versus hybrid approach. Uh, to the checker, yeah. How difficult it is for cell to just insert random checks whenever they couldn't figure out statically? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure specifically whether that would be whether that would be a challenge with with the way ESPX works now. But my guess is that you could use a technique very much like deputies to insert to to insert checks based on the cell annotations. So you could take <clears throat> uh, you could take a lot of this existing code that's been annotated with with uh, cell annotations, and if it doesn't work entirely statically, you could insert some runtime checks to compensate for that. And it might make the process of, of pushing cell annotations into Microsoft code a little bit easier. Yeah? Is it, uh, related to this uh, hybrid uh, checking stuff, so you mentioned in your talk that uh, it's important to do the optimization to reduce the redundancies between checks. Right. So, but if you didn't do any of those and you were just checking everything at runtime, not mm -hmm. statically, do you have any idea of how what would be the, the performance hit, and also how many of these annotations would still be there, so to speak? So how many of optimi right. the optimization get rid of? Right. Uh, so it would be pretty huge, and the so I in a sense, it's uh, it depends on how many on, on how the 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 so there there are two portions: one that inserts a, one that inserts checks, and one that eliminates the checks. And and if you want to see how well the how well the optimizer does. If you want to make it work better, you can always insert more stupid checks on the when you're inserting checks to begin with. Um, so in many cases, the checks that we insert, it's we insert we, we remove tons of checks, and it would be incredibly slow without the optimization. But that's because but that's because they're designed with, they're designed in order to do this. The uh, it's designed such that you can insert stupid checks to begin with and get rid of them later. Uh, it can be a little bit more specific. You okay. Have huge impact or tons of checks, but like an order of magnitude, two order of magnitude. Like 100 checks to one, or I mean, in, in many cases, it doesn't even compile. Uh, for example, there's a, there's a, if you want to do a, many pointers are just are bounded by themselves and themselves plus one. So it's a pointer to a single object. Um, if they're an opaque pointer where they don't have the structure filled out in that particular, in that particular comp compilation unit, it's illegal to increment by one. Um, but we can statically prove in all cases where you'd use that 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 you know, you're, you're never comparing against that plus one boundary. So all the checks that involve p plus one get eliminated. Um, but if you try to just compile it with those checks in, it'll say, I'm sorry, you can't increment this pointer that doesn't have a known, uh, whose type doesn't have a known size. So in many cases, you can't even compile it. If you did compile it, I'd imagine you'd have you know, like a 10x loadout or something like that. Um, but it's not really a relevant number, because the, because the whole thing has been designed with this, with this optimization pass in mind. Um, the optimization pass leaves maybe uh, the number of optimizations that are left, which is probably a, a more relevant, uh, a more relevant measurement, um, tends to be the code size tends to be sort of, uh, it's definitely within two x tends to be more like you know 1.25 or 1.5. Um, the you end up getting maybe one check per. It's it can be as high as one check per five lines of code, as low as maybe one check per hundred or one check per thousand, depending on what sort of check what, what sort of program you're writing. So that's maybe that maybe gives you an idea of, of 
what the optimizer is doing and how many checks we're adding. But there's an upper bound like for every point of the reference, for instance, there's at most one check, for instance? Not, not necessarily, Sorry. because, because this, this mutation reasoning can, uh, uh, so the way the mutation works is it says, it effectively says, check every other variable in the, in the environment and make sure that, they, that their invariants are, are upheld as well. So for example, we had some cases in the original implementation of Deputy where there was a giant structure that had tons of fields. If you modified one field in there, the mutation re reasoning would cause it to go and recheck all fields within that structure, and it would emit lots of checks that just said, you know, is p less than or equal to p? Is p plus 1 less than or equal to p plus 1 for every field in the structure? So you'd have, you know, hundreds of checks for a single statement, all of which would get eliminated by the optimizer. Yeah? So do you, do you have subtypes in your... In your yeah, so there's, there's a simple subtyping rule which basically says you can shrink the bounds whenever you want. Um, so if you, have, if you have a pointer bounded by P and, or by base B and N E, then you can cast that to a pointer whose new base and new end are within the old bounds but still contain the pointer itself. And that's, and that's, that's actually a very important rule because that's where all the bounds checks are derived. Yes. Question about your, your update rule. So <clears throat> the way you, you said you, you're going to handle this problem of mutation and having dependencies on it is by treating the local environment as an, inv an invariant and proving that you're maintaining invariant at every update. Right. So did you find in practice that this limited the kinds of updates you could do? For example, um, you know, your, your structure that had a pointer in the, in the length scale, right? Often I might want to reallocate this array, maybe double its size, maybe half right. its size, and I have to do two updates to reestablish this invariant. Right. So would deputy prevent me from doing that? Um, in some cases, yes. So the question was about if you have, if you want to do multiple updates to sort of data that depends on one another, uh, because you're maintaining this flow and sense of invariant. It's true that in in many cases, if you if you assign to just one field, you'll get an error because you, the, the, the program state is, is momentarily inconsistent. Um, uh, there are a few ways to get around this. One way is uh, deputy's type invariant actually allows any, any bounds to be attached to a null pointer. So uh, often what you do is you null out a pointer, change its bounds, and then assign the new pointer. And, and at each step there, the program will be okay. Um, we haven't found that to be a big burden. Um, we've, you, so far, we've mostly just gone and manually made that change where necessary, and it it's, uh, hasn't been a huge burden. It hasn't been a, a huge chunk of our time. If it does turn out to be, you can, do a little bit, you can do a little bit better by having a parallel assignment rule, which is actually just an extension of the, of the uh, single assignment rule that you've, we've seen earlier that allows you to reason about multiple statements at once. So, so does that mean that you're not really checking uh, for null pointer statically at all? Um, well, the null, the null pointer check would also be done, would be, would, could also be kicked to, to runtime if necessary. Right. It, so, so could I annotate a field with saying it's not null? Um, you could, but that would prevent you from doing this sort of, uh, this sort of dance with nulling out a pointer right. to change its bounds. What about initialization? Do you, do you, so if I annotate a field as not null, can you, can you properly check that I initialize this field um, The, let's see. The, the checking for non-null is a little bit limited right now. So if you annotate, a, if you annotate something as non-null, typically, it typically it's designed for use in function arguments where initialization isn't an issue. Um, I'm not sure if we do the right thing for fields. OK. Uh, so that was, I think, the end of the slide on independent types. Um, there's also a bunch of work on the system side. So for binary instrumentation, there's uh, earlier there's SFI, software fault isolation, and, and uh, just this recent OSDI, XFI, um, which sort of takes a different approach to this problem by looking at uh, the binary themselves uh, and doing some, doing some uh, instrumentation to the binary and then having a verifier that can verify that the binary is, uh, is secure for, ha has all the appropriate checks in it. Um, in some ways, there, in some ways it's, uh, it's an orthogonal technique to, to Deputy's approach because one is looking at the binary, one is looking at the, at the source level. And in fact, you could... Uh, you can hopefully design a, a verifier that works on deputy-generated code the same way you uh, design a verifier for, uh, uh, for XFI. There's also hardware-based isolation. I've talked a fair amount about NOOCs, but there's also Zen, 
um, which uses a virtual machine approach, uh, which is also sort of hardware based, and then it uses the the hardware mem memory protection for a lot of its uh, for a lot of its work. And finally, there's uh, language based isolation. So uh, these are cases where where we've uh, tried to design a new operating system with a safe language, like Singularity, of course, um, and Spin. And there also there's also work like the Java OS and the Lisp machine, um, all of which take the approach of you know let's let's make a completely new code base in a type safe language as opposed to taking existing code and trying to and trying to you know uh, shoehorn it into a, a safe language all right so uh, in the future in general um, I'm interested in developing language tools and techniques to uh, improve systems code so I'd like to look at existing C code see how programmers uh, are writing that code and and see how much of that we can we can capture in a programming language tool uh, so Deputy is an example of this, where we sort of looked at how programmers wrote, uh, how programmers wrote down pointer bounds, how they manipulated pointers, and tried to take as much of that as we could and encode it uh, in types that the compiler can understand. Uh, and of course, uh, I'd like to validate this result in real systems. So an upcoming challenge, uh, it's a little out there, but uh, look at having a type safe version of Windows. Now, unless you think that this is totally crazy, uh, we're actually doing this for Linux right now. Um, we've got we've got a 300,000 line Linux kernel that is that is has all the sort all the sort of basic features you need from a Linux kernel. Um, it boots on a VMware virtual machine. It has you know, you know EXE2 file system and the all the appropriate drivers for the VMware's devices. Uh, we are about two thirds of the way through applying Deputy to this uh, to this 300,000 line uh, Linux kernel and should get to the whole thing within a month or two and. Uh, at that point, it's just a matter of sort of looking at what the trusted portions of the code are, um, w and what we need to do in terms of adjusting the code and adjusting the tool in order to in order to actually uh, process all of Linux. So if we can do that with Linux, we should be able to do that with Windows as well, right? Um, hopefully, it can happen. So type safety is still modulo D allocation, right? This is yes. So for when I talk about when I talk about the Linux work we're doing, it's still modulo D allocation, and. And certainly, so the, one of the nice things is that you can actually reason about them uh, largely separately. I mean, they, they, they're obviously important dependencies, but you can, you, can, you can do all this type safety work without having to solve the deallocation problem and vice versa. Um, so, so, yes, so we could, we could do this without first reasoning about deallocation, but that's also, of course, an interesting thing to tackle. Um, I think that there's probably similar solutions that you could apply to deallocation as well, um, where you look at, uh, you know, as, as a programmer, I feel like I reason about allocation very locally and and with uh, uh, relatively simple logic, and that's the sort of thing where I'd like to be able to to capture that and encode it somehow in a, in a language tool that could enforce correct use of those rules. Uh, which leads me to the next slide, which is uh, sound analyses analyses for large systems. So basically, um, systems systems research is focused a lot on finding bugs and on using sort of heuristic tools to find, you know, well. Uh, here's a here's a li list of possible errors, and here are the most likely ones, and here's a bunch of false positives. Instead, we'd like to focus on something where the metric is more: uh, how much code did you have to trust, and how much uh, is actually is actually checked and guaranteed to, to lack bugs of a particular kind. And using this sort of incremental and hybrid approach, I think we can make a lot of progress there. Uh, the open problems I've listed: so first of all, deallocation is is one thing that's very amenable to this, and concurrency is another thing where uh, where you know we're still sort of uh, fumbling around to get a handle on how to on how to reason about this in a big system like Linux or Windows, um, and this is one place where where this incremental and hybrid pro approach might help. Further down the road, I'm interested in looking at new systems languages. Um, so we've we've suffered through C for 30 years, and uh, there should be it's, it's still sort of the go-to language if you're writing something uh, low level that has to interact directly with hardware. Uh, we should be able to have a language that has that has some of the that has more expressivity and power, the sorts of things that you'd see in higher level languages, but doesn't destroy the sort of the simplicity that that people like from the C language. Uh, and hopefully, by looking at existing code and seeing what pro why programmers use C and what they're doing in these C programs, we can transition these programs to to uh, this new language. So, overall, uh, Deputy uses dependent types to enforce uh, type and memory safety in C programs. From the PL point of view, we have a decidable, sound, and usable dependent type system, um, from the and one that works on actual real-world software. Uh, 
from the system point of view, we have this, uh, this language-based technique that gives us simple and low overhead checking uh, for safety properties in a, in a small portion of code that can be sort of incrementally expanded uh, as, as the programmer has time. And the bottom line is that PL tools can solve big systems problems. So uh, acknowledgments, there's my advisor, George Nicola, and Eric Brewer was uh, also very helpful. Um, Matt Heron and Zach Anderson did a lot of uh, did a lot of work on Deputy itself. Feng Zhao worked on the Safe Drive portion. David Gay, Rob Ennels, Bill McCloskey, and Ilya Bogrock um, all helped out with testing and suggestions and so on. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Jim, how much is this going to work for C plus uh, plus? Good question. Um, so. I think I think a fair portion of it could could work for C++. In fact, the big the big barrier is infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of uh, right now we you know we have a nice infrastructure for taking C programs, simplifying them so that you can do this analysis and instrumentation. In C++, there are a lot of nasty corners that make it that make it difficult to do the same sort of the same sort of analysis and instrumentation. Compared to previous tools like, like Secured, for example, Deputy is actually much more amenable to this sort of change. Because all the, the only changes that Deputy needs to make are inserting runtime checks, as opposed to changing the layout of data structures, which is a bit more complicated. Um, but still, it's a, matter of, it's a matter of just writing the infrastructure to take C++ code and present it to the tool in a, in a usable format. Um, but it's the, the principles are totally the same, and I think it, you know, it could work more or less as is. So you, you don't need to extend the type system to deal with classes and inheritance. I'm, you know, I'm sure you need to think about these things, uh, but I think that I think that there there's sort of there's sort of technical pro technical problems that are that are that will, that could be overcome with a reasonable amount of work. Um, the the biggest problem is just is just infrastructure and sort of engineering. Yes. So your first example was. Uh, Casting a manager to an intern, right? Casting, Casting a, a manager, yeah, right? And in uh, deputies type and memory state, right? Right. So, but a lot of C code does this kind of cast because they encode subtyping or whatever thing in, in some other form. Right. So, in all your, your code that you've already uh, run through deputy, how do you run into lots of problems? Yeah, and there are a fair amount of cases where we have to trust the code because we run into cases like this that deputy can't check. Um, there are some cases like, like these sorts of upcasts and downcasts that you mentioned where uh, we're looking at ways to capture those within deputy itself. Like for example, you could say that the, the type of this void star uh, depends upon the value of this, uh, of this function pointer that's elsewhere in, in the structure. But the, the dependency is a little bit less clean than, than it is for the pointer bounds case. Um, a, a better solution with a little bit more programmer work is to actually have the programmer add a runtime type information field associated with these with these with these upcasts and downcasts, so that you can directly say this the type of this void star depends upon the value of this tag field, um, and that would be a very nice way to, to write this down. Um, it's it's sort of a trade-off between whether you want to have a uh, you want to sort of find some existing dependency where it exists, or whether you want to have the programmer make some changes. Um, if the programmer makes changes, the nice part the nice the nice thing about that is that even though even though you're making changes to the data structure, it's at the programmer's point of view. So the programmer gets to see the changes and make sure that they're compatible across modules. Um, so yeah, for now, a lot of those things are just trusted by deputy. Yes. Um, in what way do you specify the kernel interfaces that you use? <coughs> so uh, typically, when somebody's when somebody's applying deputy to a driver, um, the the inference mechanism will indicate cases when when uh, an, an annotation is probably necessary. And so the programmer goes through and finds the appropriate uh, functions of the kernel headers and adds annotations. Um, so it's sort of, it's sort of incrementally, as, you're, as we're processing a, a driver, we'll find the kernel, kernel APIs that it calls and go and annotate those. Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah, actually, the question was, is there a generic way of, of Oh, is there a generic way of doing it? kernel API or, or is there any ideas, or are there any ideas how to do this? So, so do you mean, do you mean a way to, uh, a way to sort of automatically generate these or specify them in bulk? Yeah, well, I understand you have started uh, doing this. So right. So how, the question was, how do you do this? Right. I mean, right now it's just manually one by one. 
Um, and, and the nice thing about the approach is that because you can, because you can just pro process a small portion of code at, at a given time and then test it, uh, it's actually pretty feasible to just one by one annotate these by hand. Um, it, could be, it could very well be possible to, take a, to do a, a single whole program pass, uh, to, to take all the code, merge it together, do a single pass to generate likely annotations for some of these functions, and then use that to, to give the programmer a best guess. So say, this is probably what it is, but have the programmer come and refine it if necessary. Um, so there, there are certainly ways that we could, we could look at generating them a little bit more automatically, but we haven't done that yet. Other questions? All right. Thank you.